throw the drumstick. I could still hear that guy. I'll turn down more after this. Yep. Just, just stay with me. have a drum injury or something. I don't know why my hand's bleeding. I don't know what I did. All right. We're back in business. All right. Beginning in verse 1, the word of the Lord reads, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your house shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The king, the, the thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me and for me as we begin? Father, we come before you today and we ask, Lord, that you would be our teacher, that your spirit would guide us into all truth. Father, we just pray that we would see with eyes of faith today as we just sang, that we would walk by faith, not by sight. And so, Father, we just pray for the one here who might not know you through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that today would be 
the day of their salvation, that they would stop trusting themselves, stop looking to the things of this world, but look to Christ, the eternal glory, the, invisible, the image of the invisible God. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless us as a church. We ask, as Daniel asked, that you would bless us in accordance to your mercy. We do not deserve blessings, but you give it because you are a loving, kind, gracious, and merciful God. So, Father, I pray that you would continue to bring those to us who would help us as a church, who would make us strong, who would edify us, who would join in with the work of the ministry to proclaim Christ as King and the exalted Lord of the universe. Father, we also ask that you would keep those from us who would do us harm, those who would divide us, who would bring in false doctrines or an air of bitterness in their attitude, Lord. We just pray that you keep us from those people. Help us, Lord, to fight for the unity that you've given us, to fight diligently to preserve it. There's no cruise control when it comes to it, Lord, so help us to be active in pursuing the unity you've given us in Christ Jesus. And Father, we ask that you would bless us, bless our ministries. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. If there's one thing that is for certain, it's how certain we are that we don't know the future. I'll say that again in a different way. There's one thing that's certain, it's how uncertain we are of the future. See, despite our best efforts to to figure out the best that we can, what lies ahead, our attempts fall flat. And history is full of people who believe that they had the inside information into knowing what was coming down the pipeline, only to be proven spectacularly wrong. For example, the famous preacher, William Miller, he has said that Jesus was going to return October 22nd. He was certain of it. I know what you're thinking. Well, he's wrong because we're well over a week past that which is true, but we're actually well over 150 years past that because he predicted that Jesus would return October 22nd of 1944, or 1844, actually. Needless to say, William Miller did not know the future. And yet, no matter how many religious leaders come along and fail to predict Christ's return, people are still doing this, like all the time. There was just another one last October that that I heard of where people were saying, Christ is coming back on this day. They connect it to the feast, all this kind of stuff. I'm just like, yeah, now he's not coming back on that day because you predicted it. That's how this works. So stop predicting the future if you want Christ to come back. No, I'm joking. But the point is, people keep doing this. For instance, Harold Camping, you probably heard this name. He was a popular radio evangelist. He predicted that the world would end on May 21st of 2011. Needless to say, he's wrong right? But still, many people believed Harold Camping. They sold their belongings. They sold their houses. Many people even quit their jobs in anticipation for the certainty in their mind that Christ was coming back on that day. But like all other days people predict, it came and went, and Camping's followers were forced to face the harsh truth that he had been wrong, just like so many of the other prophets who came before him. And I don't know about you, but this always leaves me wondering one thing when it comes to this, at least one thing, more than that, but especially one thing. Why do y'all keep selling your stuff? Like, I don't get it. Like, do you ha- like where in the Bible does it say when Jesus comes back, like you're going to get points for everything you got rid of before he came back? Like, why sell your stuff? I don't get it. Now, to be fair, it's not just religious leaders who have failed spectacularly in trying to predict the future. Many so-called experts, I mean, how many times have we heard global warming is going to end the world 10 years ago, all the time, all the time, right? And they use their data and they predict with confidence, except for they all fumble just as badly. For example, back in 1977, Ken Olson, the founder of the Digital Equipment Corporation, he famously said this, there's no reason why anyone would ever want a computer in their home. Oops, he was wrong. Absolutely, he was wrong. And so are all the other people who make these predictions. I mean, for example, back when the automobile was invented, they said, well, that's never going to replace the reliability of a good old horse. What did they say about the Titanic? That's an unsinkable ship. Uh, it was sinkable. <laughs> there was an other people who said, and I quote, the internet is just a fad. <laughs> Wrong again. The point is humanity's ability to know and predict the future is abysmally bad. It's terrible. And yet, we can't seem to help ourselves with this intrigue we have with figuring out what's coming down the line. 
We all have an innate desire to, to figure this out. Why? Because we want to know and control our futures, right? We don't want to be on a roller coaster, on, you know, without the things strapped in. We want to get this all figured out so we know exactly where it's going. We want to know all this. So for example, there's all sorts of ways we try to do this as a culture, from horoscopes to astrology apps. Don't download those, by the way. From bizarre things like those to trying to control our health perfectly with the exact right diet, with the exact right vitamins, the exact right exercise. Because if we get that figured out, we'll never get sick and we'll never die. Or at least we'll live to like a ripe old age of 500. Okay, This is how we think. And yet, even when you try to live healthy, you still get sick. And spoiler alert, you still die. Right? We cannot control our future, no matter if we have a one-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10 or a 20-year plan, we can't control it. Even though we think we can, we can't. This is why every four years, so many people go utterly bananas with trying to control the future how? Through the ballot box. And because we believe this, so many people spend hours and hours just saturating themselves with news upon news, getting themselves all stressed out, getting themselves all anxious over this, over something they can't actually ultimately control as an individual person. They turn into being anxious and worrisome people and all their efforts don't change a thing, except for it makes them more stressed and miserable. We are, you could say, as a people, as a human race, we are obsessed with the future, which brings us to Daniel chapter two, where we find good company with another man who is obsessed with the future, a man named King Nebuchadnezzar of the great empire of Babylon, who like so many today thought he could figure out the hidden mysteries of the future. And through King Nebuchadnezzar's story, we find powerful reasons not to try to figure them out through the means he looked to, which were bad sources, but instead to stop trying to control our future and trust the God who is sovereign over the future. That's a much better approach. He's in control of it. He's the author of human history, as we just read from Daniel chapter 2. And so through Nebuchadnezzar's story, We find powerful reasons to trust him, and we find in this passage four reasons why we should trust the God of mysteries. We should trust him because, one, he's merciful. Praise God for that. Two, he's sovereign, he's wise, and he is faithful. So the way this chapter begins here is Nebuchadnezzar keeps having a reoccurring prophetic dream. Okay, Notice it said dreams in the verse. It didn't say dream. He's having dream. He keeps having it over and over and it's haunting him. It's, it's freaking him out. All right. And his dream wasn't at all like the dreams you and I are have on a regular basis. Cause, cause our dreams are crazy, right? Like they make no sense at all, which is why we almost never tell people our dreams because we know they'd look at us like you're nuts. Like I'm not going to tell you my dreams, but you're nuts, right? Cause they are nuts. Right, And then when you try, you always feel silly. You're like, yo, you were in my dream last night, but then you weren't, but then you were, but it wasn't really you. It was you being you, and then you stopped being you, and then you were me. (laughs) Right, like That's the kind of dreams we have. And you try to articulate this stuff, and it's wild. And what's sad is so many people look to their dreams like that, and they're like, that's from God. I got to figure this out. And there's a whole host of people who will come along and say, yeah, that is from God. Give me some money. I'll tell you what it means. It's nonsense, all right? This wasn't the kind of dream King Nebuchadnezzar had. He was having what is called prophetic dreams, which are dreams that have a clearly distinct divine origin to them, okay? When you have a prophetic dream, you're not gonna wake up wondering, hmm, I wonder if that was God. You're gonna wake up like, oh boy, oh boy, there's a holy God, what do I do, okay? That's what these dreams are like. Now, just in case you're wondering, well, was my crazy dream I just described, was that prophetic? I can tell you it's not. And here's why. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says this, long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets and often through dreams to those prophets. But verse 2, but in these last days, how has he spoken to us? By his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. Here's the point, church. We have so much better a thing to know God's revelation than prophetic dreams. What do we have? You're holding it in your hands or it's on your your phone right there. It's God's perfect and errant word. It is all we need for life and godliness. 
That's it. It's right here. It's so much better than dreams. It's, it's spelled out. And that's why we as a church, we labor every single Sunday to go verse by verse through God's word to understand it and live it out in our lives. We have everything we need for life and godliness. Now that's not today's sermon. So I had to mention it, but that's a, that's a whole different sermon itself. So we'll leave that for now. All right, back to King Neb. Can I call him Neb? I'm gonna call him Neb. All right, so King Neb was having prophetic dreams and this was freaking him out. He, he was terrified about these. And so he turns to the guys who claim they had expertise in interpreting these dreams. These are the wise men, the magicians, the enchanters, and the sorcerers who all did not worship Yahweh God. They worshiped the false gods. All right. And yet when he turned to these guys, did he get any answers? No, he got no answers. Okay. So let's talk about these three groups. First off, We have the magicians. These are called soothsayers. You might see in your translation, but these are basically the Babylonian priests. All right, these were kind of the scholarly class of Babylon. And these guys, they specialized in reading, writing, and not arithmetic, but the future. So reading, writing, and knowing the future. That was their expertise, okay? Then you have the enchanters, which also could be called the conjurers, or they're basically mediums. And these guys claim that they could bridge the gap between the living and the dead, They said they could do that, and they could actually commune with them and get inside information from the dead, all right, and relay messages to and from them. Then we have the sorcerers, all right? These guys specialized in black magic, okay, divination. And a part of that was they studied the stars, all right, astrology, okay? And this is actually, this this group, I think, is where the magi, as we're going to see in about a month here, when we look at the, the first coming of Christ, they actually trace back their lineage to this group of people who Daniel heavily influences, which is why they were looking for the birth of the messianic, cl- messianic king, okay? So the point, though, is Neb gathers these guys, all right? And most scholars believe these were probably guys who were appointed by his father, all right? And so he wasn't like good buddy buddies with them and stuff, and he was kind of annoyed. They'd been on the government payroll for a long, long time. And in verse two, he basically says to him, all right, guys, time, time to earn your keep. Time to earn your keep here. All right, I had a dream. Tell me what my dream was and what it means. Okay, now here's the question. Did King Neb, did he know what his dream was or had he forgotten his dream, right? We have that where we wake up and we're like, man, I had an intense dream. I don't know what it was about. We have that. Which one was it? I don't know. Scholars are divided. They can't really decide. It doesn't really matter. All right. But regardless, he says, tell me what my dream was and what it means. And they respond, uh, that's, that's not how this works. Not how any of this works. But they don't say that because he's the king and he holds their life in their hands. And so they begin with flattery and they say, oh, king, live forever. Ironically, not knowing, as we're going to see in the weeks to come, that this vision itself showed that king and even the Babylonian empire was not going to live forever. All right. It's a little bit of irony there, I think. And then they go on to explain how they can't interpret said dream unless they know what said dream was. That's their explanation. Like, you got to give us the dream, all right? We're not mind readers. And he's like, yeah, but you claim to have inside information to the gods. Prove it. Earn your keep. And they can't. They can't do it. He says, my word is firm. Tell me what it means or you are dead. You will be torn limb from limb and your house will be made a dunghill. But on the flip side, if you interpret my dream, you tell me what it is and you interpret it, I'll make you kings. I'll make you rulers. I'll make you rich. All right, that's the offer. I'll reward you greatly. So the wise men, they protest once more because they're they're charlatans. They can't do this. All right, but king, he's not going to have anything to do with it. And so they respond with what I think is actually a pretty profound truth in verses 10 through 11. Look Look at these verses with me, please. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands for no great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. Then the thing the king asks is difficult and no one can show it except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And just a reminder, Christmas is coming and we're celebrating the fact that that's not true because Emmanuel means God with us. So anyways, but the point here is they're busted, all right? They just had to admit that they can't do really what they've been claiming to be able to do all along, which is commune with the gods and get inside information on the future to reveal hidden mysteries. They say only the gods can do this, which the question then is, all right, why do you guys even exist? What is your purpose? And the answer in King Neb's mind is nothing. You got no purpose. Let's chop them up because they've been duping me and my father for a long time. 
But then in verse 14, after the king decides, kill them all, done with them, they're useless. They go to collect Daniel and his young three friends for the offing of the heads. And Daniel responds to the king. He's like, why, why is the rush? All right, we just find out about this. What's going on? So Daniel talks to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, and he finds out what's going on. And then Daniel does what all followers of Yahweh do when things look look terrifying and bleak. He freaks out. He goes into panic mode, stressing how he's, you know, he's got to get himself. No, he doesn't do that, does he? Doesn't do that at all. We don't see Daniel responding with anxiety and worry in any way, shape, or form here. And if you're feeling rebuked at all like that, by that, like I was when prepping this, just hold on because there's more. Next, Daniel goes to the king and he politely asks for time so he can ask his God to provide the dream and the interpretation. The king agreed. Because after, after all, at the end of Daniel chapter 1, we saw how God gave Daniel and his three friends what? Wisdom and knowledge. He gave them both of those things. And in fact, as we saw there, Daniel and his three friends proved themselves to be 10 times better than all the rest of the wise men. And so the king, he says, all right, I suppose I can give the guy who's 10 times better than the rest a little bit of time. And so Daniel then gets to work. And what does he do? Then does he freak out and start desperately trying to figure out a way out of this? You know, maybe we can sneak out of the, out of the castle. We can, we can leave. No, he doesn't do any of that. He goes to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he tells them, as we see in verse 18, that they should plead before God. They should seek his mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. That's what they do. And if it wasn't for the fact that we have more to cover today, we could actually do the benediction right there and have plenty to apply to our lives, I think, in the week to come. But we're not going to stop. We've got more to cover. So the point is, though, this is exactly how we do not respond on a regular basis, myself included, right? When things get hard, when I have trials pop up in my life, I'm just like you are. And I struggle at times to start, what do I got to do? You know, call this person, call that person. What am I going to do to figure this out? And yet, that's not how we are supposed to respond as those who walk by faith. We're not supposed to do that. We are supposed to remember that God is merciful and he's in the heavens. The two truths that leads Daniel to pleading before him. When we forget these truths, though, what happens? Then we respond with panic. We respond with with anxiety, with, with stress, with fear. And this is what this looks like. Okay, so first off, when things get dark, when they get, when they get difficult, how does this show that we've forgotten that God is the God of the heavens? Does the question make sense? When things get stressful, how does that show that we're not remembering God is the God of the heavens? Okay, well, first off, it's because in that moment, we are pretending, we are acting as if we are the God of the heavens. We are not the God of the heavens, right? We're looking to ourselves to solve all of our problems, to figure out how to get ourselves out of this mess, to control our future. But the reality is we are not the God of the heaven. We cannot control everything. We cannot control our future. Only the sovereign God of the universe can. Now, that sovereign God point, that's our second point in our outline. So I'm going to stop for there. That's all I'm going to say. But secondly, how does freaking out, how does you know, getting all stressed out when we go through dark times show that we've forgotten the second truth, which is God is merciful? All right, well, it does this in two ways, all right? When we get stressed out, it's showing that we've forgotten God's mercy in two ways, okay? So first off, it shows that we've forgotten that God hears our prayers in accordance to his mercy, just like he did for Daniel and his three friends in verse 19. We forget this all the time. When hardship comes, our first response is not to pray to our merciful God of the heavens and ask him for help. Instead, what do we often do? We call our friends, we call our family members, or even our counselor, right? And those are all great people to ask advice from, but not first, right? Who should we be going to first, church? The sovereign, merciful God of the heavens, right? And I'm as guilty as you are when it comes to this, which is why I said we got more convicting rebukes to come. We often forget that God is a merciful God in the heavens, and it results in us not living our lives and acting as if he can hear our prayers and actually do something about it because he can. Now, maybe you do go to God, the God of the heavens when things get tough, but you do so forgetting that he's a merciful God, that he is a God of mercy and not a God of obligation. 
Those are huge differences. If you think God is a God of obligation and instead he's a God of mercy, that is going to change your attitude, your perspective, and your approach to your prayers entirely. Instead, you're going to approach him with a sense of entitlement. God, you got to do what I think. And if you don't do it, then you're not good or you're not in control. Pick your poison. This is how so many people think. And we do at times if we're honest about it. Whether we articulate this directly like that ourselves, we start to act this way. And when we forget this, what happens when God doesn't answer our prayers, we become disillusioned with God and we we get disillusioned because we've bought the lie that says God's purpose as the sovereign Lord of the heavens is to make me happy. That's why he exists. That's his job. But it's not his job, church. It's not his job to do this. Which is why in the next chapter, I love how Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah respond when they face the fiery furnace. Here's what they say. They say, if this be so, our God, if this be so being thrown into the fiery furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see the response? These young teenage boys, they trust God, not just as the God of heavens, of the heavens who can powerfully answer prayers, but also as the God of mercy, recognizing that if he answers graciously and lovingly and kindly, that's all out of his mercy. He doesn't have to give mercy in any way, shape or form. He doesn't have to save them from the fiery furnace. He has no obligation whatsoever. All right, and they think this way, not because they think God is this just cruel, angry God who just loves watching his people suffer. No, it's because they believe that God is both good and sovereign, which leads us to our second point. After Daniel and his three friends pray to the God of the heavens, God mercifully answers their prayer in verse 19 by giving Daniel the dream and the interpretation. So what does Daniel do next? How does he respond once he gets the dream and the interpretation? Does he rush right away to the king and say, king, 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 I got the answer. No. Who does he rush to? The ultimate king, God. And he stops and first blesses the God of heaven with praise, with worship. I did tell us we could do the benediction earlier because I told you there were more rebukes coming. How many times, church, does God answer our prayers mercifully and kindly and we go and tell everybody else what he's done for us without first stopping to praise and bless his wondrous name? Guilty as charged, and you are too. And yet Daniel and his three friends did not. They blessed his name. They worshiped his name with joyful praise, just as we ought to do when God responds in his loving kindness to us, when he hears our prayers in his mercy. Personally, this is why I would much, much, much rather do 90%, if not all of our worship at the end of the sermon. Why? Because worship is the right and proper response to the truth about God. Worship is the right and proper response to hearing the truth of God revealed. And if it's not, if the preaching and teaching of God's word does not lead you to want to worship and celebrate and bless his name, that, hear me when I say this, that is an extremely serious problem. An extremely serious problem. Which means that if we come each and every Sunday and we leave without our hearts burning, without our hearts longing to shout joyful praise, to bless his holy name, what it means is I don't care how much you learned, you didn't actually learn a thing that day. That's how serious this is, right? Because you didn't really learn anything. Sure, you got some truths, but it hasn't penetrated from the head to the heart. It hasn't changed your affections. And here's the thing, until we come to see God for who he is, who he truly is, and then, and then respond singing that he is worthy, 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 you know how we're gonna respond to the truth of God's word? We're not gonna sing he's worthy, worthy, worthy. We're gonna simply sing he's necessary, necessary, necessary. That is a humongous difference, a humongous difference, which means if you view God not as worthy, but necessary, it means that your view of God is he's the genie who's in the bottle, in the, in the lamp or whatever, right? You gotta, you gotta you know, come out, he gives you your wishes. And as one famous preacher put it, 
It basically means that you think God exists to grant our wishes and satisfy our idolatry. He does not exist for those purposes, not in the slightest. This is why when we worship together as a church, which is one of my favorite things to do, and I see people not singing or I see people there joyously mumbling through the words, I never get mad, all right? So just be clear, I never get mad. I just get sad about it. And it does, it grieves me as your pastor because what I'm wanting is not just loud singing for the sake of loud singing. What I'm wanting, what I'm desperately longing for is that everyone here would come to see God as we just sang a moment ago as both our delight and our reward. And if you see God as your delight and your reward, we can muzzle you with masks. We can do all sorts of things. You're still gonna be singing out loudly, joyously, triumphantly, just as we see how Daniel responds here in Daniel chapter two with Daniel's psalm of praise, right? Worship is a heart issue. I've heard Christians say, I just don't like this thing. Like, that's a problem. That's a problem. In Daniel's psalm here, he says in verse 20 and 21, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He does it. And that doesn't just mean the good kings. That means the bad ones too. He is the one who appoints all of this. The point here is very, very simple, but it's very profound. God is in complete and total sovereign control, period, full stop. He is. He absolutely is. And a good pastor buddy of mine, he said it this way. He said, you will only pray about the things that you believe that God is sovereign over. Did you catch that? You will only pray about the things that you believe God is sovereign over. And yet how often do we, who believe God is totally sovereign, not pray over the things God is sovereign over? Shameless plug for prayer and praise. This Wednesday, 530, I'll see everyone there. As one theologian put it, there is not a single rogue molecule in the entire universe. Not one. Not one. Notice here that Daniel responds this way, praising God for his sovereignty in a situation that you wouldn't think he would. What's his situation? He's in exile. His nation had just been crushed by the evil pagan Babylonian empire. And yet, how does Daniel respond to this? By continuing to trust in his sovereign God because he knows God is completely sovereign. And because God is completely sovereign, it means something profound. It means that Babylon, the greatest nation at this time in the known world, who was completely pagan, was just an episode before God. That's all it was. A short episode too. Do you know what this means? I'll tell you one thing it means. It means that in the midst of an election season, even when things look dark, and they do look dark, we can still confidently sing as we sing here regularly, though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God is, is the ancient of days. You believe that? It'll change your life if you do. It'll change your stress. It'll change your behavior. It'll change a lot of things for the good if you do. And if you don't believe that, buckle up. You're in for a ride. No matter what happens in our life, we can confidently trust in the sovereign God who is the ancient of days. For he and he alone appoints the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings, no matter how pagan or ungodly they might be. And here's the other thing you got to remember. Not only is God a God of mercy, not only is God a God of full sovereignty, but he enacts his sovereignty, how? In accordance to his perfect wisdom, which leads us to the third point. In verses 21 and 22, Daniel's psalm of praise continues like this. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. When it comes to God's wisdom, how does our world view God's wisdom? It's junk. It's not very good. As Paul explains though, 
in 1 Corinthians, the foolishness of God, which there isn't such a thing, but he's making a hyperbolic statement here. The foolishness of God is vastly superior to even the greatest wisdom of this world. The foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of this world. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the first three chapters there. Great chapters had a, had a humongous impact on me when I was a youth pastor. I, re, I was studying 1 Corinthians over and over, and I decided to make 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3 the pattern for my ministry, which is trusting not in the wisdom of this world, but in the wisdom of God. The foolishness of preaching, which is what we gather every Sunday to do, to hear one foolish person preach the word of God, the glories of a glorious God to the best of my infall- my frail abilities. As Christians, we are tempted to forget that God's wisdom is supreme. We forget this when things don't go the way that we think they should. We start to get nervous. We start to shift in our seats a bit. We wonder, what is God thinking? Is, is he sleeping, right? What is he doing? Does, does he not see what's happening? Doesn't he know what the bad party's going to do if they get elected? Somebody needs to talk to him. Fill him in. Well, we don't need to fill him in. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He appoints times and seasons. He appoints kings and rulers. And he does so all in accordance with his perfect wisdom, which is so much greater than my wisdom, your wisdom, or anybody else's. He implements his sovereign will in accordance to his perfect wisdom as he brings about his perfect plan, which means this. Some of you might not like this, but it's true. The right person gets elected every time. Do you believe that? Even if it's the wrong person, the right person gets elected every time because no matter how bad they might be, the truth is, does God give nations their just desserts by giving them unjust rulers? He does. And a nation that has slaughtered millions and millions of the unborn, what do we deserve? The wrath of God. And so one bad political leader might just be exactly what we deserve. And still, though, it is right for us to pray that God would be merciful, that he would respond with mercy, just as Daniel did. But as we do, we must remember that God is merciful, he's sovereign, but he's wise, and his wisdom is above ours. And that means we got to trust him because he knows the hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness, that the light light dwells with him, as Daniel said. And you know what? Here's the thing. As we do all that, there's something else you got to remember, which is our fourth point. You got to remember that God is faithful. In verse 23, Daniel finishes his psalm of praise saying this, to you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. This passage has echoes of Genesis 41 and Exodus 7 written all over it. Well, what happened in those passages? That has to do with Joseph and Moses. Joseph, he revealed the dreams to Joseph and to Moses, God spoke to him directly, revealing all sorts of hidden mysteries. And it was the knowledge of God's faithfulness in the past towards his fathers, his forefathers, that drove Daniel's request to God, but also his praise because God is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, who faithfully keeps his covenant promises. And why can he do that? It's because God not only knows, but he brings sovereignly about the future. And this is seen, I think, most gloriously, most clearly through the death of his one and only son. The day after Christ died on the cross, everything looked hopeless. It looked bleak upon bleak. And yet, as God revealed the very next day, on the third day, it wasn't. The darkest event in human history wasn't a defeat. It was actually a victory, a glorious, glorious victory. It was God's greatest act of mercy that he sovereignly planned by his perfect wisdom, which now serves as the ultimate example of his faithfulness throughout all the generations. Look at the cross if you doubt God's faithfulness. If you doubt his wisdom, if you doubt his sovereignty, if you doubt his mercy, look at the cross, my friends. And as you do, remember that God can accomplish the greatest thing in all of human history, even in the worst event of all of human history. And if God can do that, what can he do with an election that doesn't go the way you think it should go? Pretty sure that's small potatoes 
compared to the death of God's holy, perfect, and only begotten son. Church, we must never forget who our God is. He is merciful, he is sovereign, he is wise, and he is faithful. And because he is, we should trust him fully, even with our very lives. After Daniel finished praising God, he went to Arioch and he extended the mercy of God that he had received to who? To the wise men, to the pagans, which is a simple point. Those who have received mercy, how can we not extend mercy to those who don't deserve mercy? We don't deserve the mercy we got. And yet often when we receive it, we start to trick ourselves into thinking, hey, you know, maybe I am better than those guys over there. Look how bad they are. No, Daniel knew better, which is why he extended God's mercy to these pagan wise men. God was working powerfully, mercifully, even in the midst of Israel's judgment. He was working mercifully. He was working faithfully. But here's the thing, not just to Israel. Oh, no, no, no. Not just to Israel, but also to Babylon. If you had to guess, what language would you say the book of Daniel's written in? If you know the answer, ch- Let's let a few people get it wrong first. You probably would guess Hebrew, and you'd be partly right, because chapter one's written in Hebrew, but then chapters two through seven are written in Aramaic, which is the language of the Babylonians, all right? And I think this was for at least two reasons. First, it was because this was a way, it was God's means of telling the pagan nations directly in their own language, guess what? You think you're in charge, I'm in charge, I'm sovereign. And secondly, this was an act of mercy and grace to bring the truths of God's glorious grace of who he is, his mercy, his righteousness to even the pagan Babylonians. And King Nebuchadnezzar here, as we're going to see in the chapters to come, he becomes a direct recipient of that grace. I think we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. God had to humble him and he did so in accordance to his mercy. He did so graciously. And that's why we must remember that God is a God of mercy, of grace, and great faithfulness. Well, that's the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and how Daniel received interpretation. And next time, we're going to look at the meaning of the dream, which continues to show God's mercy, sovereignty, wisdom, and faithfulness, but even more so. All right, and it's going to show us future events, some of which have already happened, some of which are yet to come. All right, but in the meantime, by God's grace as a church, let us continue to trust and our God of mysteries. Father, I thank you for this text. Thank you for how you've used it to shape my life already and how you are shaping us to make us more Christ-like. So Father, I just pray for the one here today who is living in stress and anxiety and worry and fear. Father, I pray that you would help them to come to see that you are sovereign, that you are wise beyond the wisdom of this world that nothing ever occurs to you. And so, Father, help us to trust in you, no matter what it may bring, whether it's persecution, nakedness, or sword, as Romans 8 says. Help us to trust that all things work together for good for those who love God. Help us to remember the, the prime example of that, which is the cross of Christ. And help us to live for Christ's glorious return by faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. From Psalm 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in the Son of Man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, O God, Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. If you would stand and join with us as we sing. Behold our God.